Did you know Coca-Cola was invented by a wounded Civil War veteran? I didn't. Learn more on this episode of Antique Bottle Stories. Coca-Cola's story starts with John Stith Pemberton, a Civil War Confederate Lieutenant Colonel who served defending Georgia during the Battle of Columbus. During this battle, he received a saber wound to the chest. This wound led to a morphine addiction, which was very common among the Civil War veterans. Pemberton decided he would come up with something to cure him of his addiction, something that he would be able to sell to a huge market of war veterans also fighting addictions. Around this time, there was a popular French medicinal drink called Vin Mariani. This drink was essentially a wine infused with the coca leaf, which is the source of cocaine. Pemberton eventually launched his own version of this medicinal wine, but his wine was infused with the cola nut for caffeine and Damiana in addition to the coca leaves. His drink was called Pemberton's French Wine Coca. John Pemberton's new drink became so popular in Atlanta that it was sold in almost every drugstore in the city. This French wine coca was said to be an invigorator of the brain, and Pemberton recommended it for overcoming morphine addictions. When asked to describe his popular drink, Pemberton said, It is composed of an extract from the leaf of the Peruvian coca, the purest wine, and the cola nut. It is the most excellent of all tonics, assisting digestion, imparting energy to the organs of respiration, and strengthening the muscular and nervous systems. In 1886, the city of Atlanta started a prohibition, so he needed to change the formula to be non-alcoholic. The most important ingredients were the coca leaves and the cola nuts, but he needed some way to deliver them in a drink that people would enjoy. So he tried sugar syrup for the base to try to replace the sweetness of the wine. Pemberton worked with Atlanta druggist Willis Venable to test and help him perfect the recipe. During that trial and error phase, they tried mixing the base syrup with carbonated water. They had a few people try the new recipe, which was deemed excellent by those who tasted it. Pemberton decided to then sell it as a fountain drink rather than a medicine. Frank Robinson, who served as a bookkeeper and partner to Pemberton, came up with the catchy new name for the drink, Coca-Cola. Robinson also hand wrote the script on the bottles and ads. Notice how the logo hasn't changed a bit since 1886. That's awesome. This new drink was marketed as delicious, exhilarating, refreshing, and invigorating. It was sold and advertised in Atlanta to war veterans suffering drug addiction, depression, and alcoholism, and to ladies and all those whose sedentary employment causes nervous prostration. In one article I read, John Pemberton reportedly was broke and slowly started selling off ownership of his brand and his secret formula. By the time he died in 1888 of stomach cancer, which, by the way, is only two years after the fountain drink started being sold, John Pemberton no longer had any stake in Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was first served on May 8, 1886 at Jacob's Pharmacy. So the guy Willis Venable, who helped him perfect the Coca-Cola recipe, had purchased a share of the ownership of Coca-Cola from John Pemberton. With that purchase, Pemberton retained a share but also received loyalty per gallon from Venable. Venable rented a space inside Joseph Jacobs' pharmacy. By the way, Joseph Jacobs' life is also an interesting read. Anyway, the fountain did a lot of business. The first servings of Coca-Cola were sold for five cents per glass. The fountain averaged about $150 a day from various drinks. Pharmacies in 1886 were not quite like today's pharmacies. They were more like general stores that dispensed medicine. They were open to women and men, and pharmacies were often gathering places for people to get news for the day, pick up their items, and enjoy a moment at the fountain. Jacob's Pharmacy was one of the leading pharmacies in Atlanta. So Venable, who's running the soda fountain, 
became strapped for cash because he was building a new house. So Venables sold his portion of the formula to Joseph Jacobs for a cash advance. At this point, a guy named Asa Candler enters the story. Jacobs and Candler knew each other, since both were Atlanta's leading pharmacists. Candler even arranged for his son, Charles, to go work at Jacobs' pharmacy so that he could learn the trade. Candler said that he was thinking about getting out of the pharmacy business, and Jacobs told him he didn't know much about Coca-Cola and he wasn't really interested in keeping stock in the product. So the two struck a deal where Candler gave Jacobs an interest in a glass factory in exchange for his share of Coca-Cola. Candler was also the one who purchased the rest of Pemberton's portion for $2,300 and soon took total control of the company and he incorporated Coca-Cola Company the following year. Pemberton died August 16, 1888. And it's said that on the day of his funeral, all the drugstores in Atlanta were closed so that their owners could go attend, and not one drop of Coca-Cola was dispensed in the entire city. The following day, a special train carried his body to Columbus, where a large group of friends, relatives, and admirers laid him to rest. The Atlanta newspapers called him the oldest druggist of Atlanta and one of her best-known citizens. Under Candler's leadership, Sales rose from about 9,000 gallons of syrup to almost 400,000 gallons from 1890 to 1900. Also during that decade, he expanded and was being sold in every U.S. state and territory as well as Canada. The trademark Coca-Cola was registered in the U.S. Patent Office in 1893. Candler did so well, he sold the Coca-Cola company in 1919 for $25 million. The distinctive Coke bottle design, called the hobble skirt, was designed in 1915 by the Root Glass Company. The bottle designer, Earl R. Dean, and his team decided to base the bottle design on the soda's two main ingredients, the coca leaf and the cola nut. Dean couldn't find any pictures of either one of those, but he became inspired by the cocoa pod and he transformed the shape of the pod into a bottle. The new Coca-Cola bottle was so distinctive it could be recognized in the dark and it effectively set the brand apart from other copycat brands. This actually set off an art deco period in the late 20s and early 30s where beverage companies were trying to come up with the next bottle that would be as distinctive as a Coke bottle, making beautiful, interesting bottles in this time frame. But as you can see, the Coke bottle outlived them all. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.